no c'è l'interruttore classico eh? <ride> troppo vero? così così no. prima era meglio vero? ok so Good morning, everyone, and first of all, thanks, Franco, uh, for this uh, uh, great opportunity to be here. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be here when uh, this is the room where I was studying, so and doing my, let's say, all all my course of studies. So I'm I'm a little bit, uh, you know, uh, always so great pleasure to be here. So. Um, okay, today I like to to make a more introductory, let's say, lecture uh, by talking about uh, what we are doing about neural neural correlates by interactions of animals uh, with environment. What does it mean, environment, in our case? In our case, it means uh, virtual reality. In the first case, in the second case, it's a real interaction between uh, between animals. So. Uh, our approach is uh, uh, to do to perform an interspecies study. So, by moving from a, a simple animal model like the zebrafish, who has the advantage of uh, being transparent, and so is, is it possible to to look at the, the entire central nervous system with single cell resolution, and then uh, uh, move uh, to uh, in this case we interact between. Uh, uh, the, the animal and, uh, and the virtual reality. In the second case, uh, we are uh, moving up in a more sophisticated, let me say, species. Uh, and uh, here, always looking at neural correlates, we studied interactions between the diets, in the diets between two animals. Uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, what I'd like to do is just uh, what we are start doing uh, by moving to humans by keeping advantage of what we learn from the animals in a transnational approach. And um, at that point, uh, again, replicates what we're doing with animals. So social interactions and interaction with the environment uh, as well. So regarding zebrafish, uh, in order to have a look to the entire uh, central nervous systems, uh, what we are doing uh, is uh, to place uh, the, the larva zebra, in this case, uh, in a in front of a, a let's say a condenser an objective of a microscope illuminate transversely with a, a, a sheet of lights it's called light sheet microscope in fact which enable to uh, illuminate only a, a, a plane of uh, of uh, of the sample and observe transversely that plane and then moving that plane in that direction is possible to reconstruct the 3d image now, the tricky part of this experiment is that we want to catch the entire brain uh, uh, with a single shot, single action potential. So uh, that means that we have to be very short. So to do that, uh, uh, we are using, uh, let's say, uh, a tricky, now I cannot show you your year. I don't want to go too much in, the, in details, technical details. A, a very complicated apparatus that is enabled us uh, to in 200 milliseconds to have an entire image of the central nervous system, let's say the brain of, of, uh, of the zebrafish. And 200 milliseconds is quite enough uh, uh, for the dynamics of, uh, um, of, the, of the signals we are looking, we are, we are going to observe. Uh, also, we are using a two photon excitation because we have to move into the infrared. And uh, because in the visible, by using conventional light sheet microscopes, you are interfere with the vision of the with the visual systems, and that that could be a, a real problem. So, uh, of course, in order to 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 see the neural activity, we have to use uh, transgenic uh, uh, transgenic models. So we are using, in this case, a, a GCAM model where. Uh, we are observing uh, by uh, G by uh, by uh, CPGFP and CM uh, promote uh, CM uh, um, uh, 
labeling uh, the uh, calcium activity of the zebrafish. And uh, these are planes uh, which can be obtained by moving uh, the lie sheet in the, in the, in the volumetric uh, area, okay? And uh, all stacks can be done in 200 milliseconds. So in, in that case, it is possible in 200 milliseconds to have the entire uh, detection of the, uh, of the whole brain with the single cellular resolution. Uh, this is, uh, a, a, let's say, a, a, there was a movie uh, uh, showing uh, with the different, uh, let's say, uh, depth into the, into the plane, into the, into the brain of, uh, of the calcium activity. And of course, we are typically pretty much interested, as we will show in human, the uh, brain-body interaction and brain with other organs interaction. In this case, we are studying two axes. We are studying brain-heart axis and brain-gut axis. And uh, this is doable thanks uh, to the fact that uh, we, by using infrared uh, detection, for example, in parallel uh, with, uh, with the brain activity, we can uh, um, collect the activity of the heart, but also uh, doing to uh, transgenic uh, labeling, we are now able to see vague nerve and, and gut uh, in terms of excitable cells. So we can see neurons in gut and we can see activation of uh, uh, vague nerve. So at that point it is possible to, to show, uh, to, to study the activation, the neural correlates in the brain and uh, the activation in the gut, in the vague nerve and the, in the heart. So this is a clear, a, a typical example of, uh, for example, a single neuron uh, calcium activity that uh, we can show here by, for example, studying a single pixel where a single neuron is pointed and in parallel to correlate uh, with the heartbeat, uh, that kind of, uh, uh, analysis. They will be replicated in human, as I will show in the last part of the talk, but uh, we hope to learn from animal models in order to have uh, a better algorithms, a better model to be replicated in humans. Of course, uh, here in the virtual reality systems, what we have to do is we have to interact with the, the animal model. To do that, uh, we realize uh, a, a double transgenic mouse where there are another molecule, which is the channel redopsin, uh, which enable to, uh, uh, it's called optogenetics, it's enable to activate the brain by using another laser. And so at that point, uh, we have a read and write system. So we can read the, active, read the brain and also program, if you like, the brain. Program the brain by using light and by activating uh, uh, particular parts uh, of, of the brain. This is in the frame of my ERC project, which is brain-to-brain -brain interface. And uh, in that case, uh, the interface is exactly the microscope, which is a second brain, if you like. It's a synthetic brain, because in the microscope, uh, we have uh, uh, all the physiology of the, of the zebrafish uh, uh, uploaded on board. And we are developing a, a, a machine learning, uh, let's say, uh, systems uh, and artificial intelligence systems that enable the, uh, the microscope to read and write in real time because uh, the uh, action potential spans in, uh, in, in milliseconds or 10 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds for action potential for, for calcium imaging. So a human is not. Um, able to react in real time to make a closed loop experiment. That means that, uh, for example, when now the machine is played, when the zebrafish is exposed to a virtual reality, we can use uh, the, the microscope as a second brain to read information and to retransfer information in real time to the zebrafish. Uh, so this is uh, functional connectivity dissection. This is uh, performed by optogenetics, uh, where uh, we uh, excite uh, one part area of the brain and we see all the projections of the excitation along the central nervous systems. And this is absolutely important in order to have a functional maps which will be used by the second brain 
uh, to, uh, to decide in, in which way to excite uh, the brain depending on the behavior of the, of the animal. Uh, these are, let's say, functional maps. And, uh, and the experiment in virtual reality is the following. First of all, it's a free-swimming zebrafish. And this is a predator, OK? It's, it's a looming, st looming stimulus that is it's growing so uh, the uh, the zebra fish uh, uh, as soon as uh, uh, dot is uh, reaching it, is escaping so the first things we have to do we have to study the uh, escaping strategy of the zebra fish that means in which way you use the tail to escape so we have to segment the behavior in this case and so we segment in four part rest c star proportion a glide and once we have done this, uh, we uh, have to reconstruct uh, by a behavioral chamber that uh, you can see here, uh, where uh, there is a, a, the, the screen with virtual reality behind it. And so uh, with, the, with the camera, we can uh, segment all the trajectory of the zebrafish and the escape strategy of the zebrafish. So we create a, a database at that point. By uh, looking at the movement of the tails, uh, we know in which direction the, the, the zebrafish is, go is going. And at that point, uh, we have a full database of the escape strategy with the movement of the tail. Now we can move to the, uh, let's say, read and write, uh, uh, let's say, experiment where we have the microscope. Of course, at that point, the zebrafish is not free to swim uh, uh, in, in, a free, in a free way, as we say before. But uh, his head is uh, constrained in, uh, in, in agarose gel, but his tail is free to move. So we can, at that point, uh, because the head is fixed, we can, at that point, uh, study uh, the brain activation. But we can also interact uh, with, uh, with the head, with the brain activation. And, uh, uh, and of course, uh, from the movement of the tail, we know from the previous experiment, the trajectory that uh, the zebrafish would have done in front of the predator. So the experiment now we are working on is the following. Uh, there is a predator. The predator is approaching, is escaping the first time. The second time escape, but a little bit less. The third one, a little bit less. The fourth one, maybe it doesn't escape anymore because it learns that it's a fake. Now we see the evolution of the neural correlates because there is a plastic evolution of the neural colleagues as soon as there is the learning procedure, as soon as uh, the zebrafish learn that it's a fake, so it doesn't have to escape anymore. Then we move, remove the zebrafish and we put a new zebrafish. At that point, uh, we transfer the learning not by experience, but by light. Oops. And so what we are doing at that point, it's programming the brain by activations, by optogenetics, and by illuminating the brain exactly with the same frequency of evolution of neural correlates. And uh, at that point, we hope uh, to uh, somehow transfer the, uh, the training, the, the learning, uh, by directly uh, working on the brain in order that at that point, as soon as uh, the, the looming uh, stimulus is presented, the, let's say the predator, uh, the zebrafish does not escape anymore without the need to be trained. So, of course, to do that, uh, we have to use uh, uh, some convolutional neural networks to transfer, uh, let's say, the information from the free swimming to the microscope. There, so there is a lot of uh, machine learning stuff. But, I mean, this is what about we are, we are working on. Now, what happens when we move to, uh, let's say, a real physical interactions between uh, uh, two, uh, two animal models? Here, uh, we are uh, studying the brain synchronicity between the, the two, the two animals. And to do that, uh, we are using two small uh, microscopes, uh, which are mounted on the head of, uh, of the mouse. It's a transgenic mouse. These are very light, 1.52 grams. Uh, uh, let's say microscopes, and uh, so they do not uh, uh, prevent the movement of, of, the, of the mouse. And the experiment is the following. So there are two chambers. The chambers are separated by a, a small uh, aperture, 
and the two mouse are interacting throughout this small aperture. We are studying uh, the both hemisphere, uh, let's say, new, uh, new neural correlates of both mouse, and uh, uh, the mouse is again a transgenic mouse, so it's a GCAMP signals, and uh, we can uh, have a look at that point uh, at uh, the uh, synchronicity between the different parts of, of the same brain or synchronicity between the two brains. Uh, by performing a wavelet analysis of the signal here, uh, we found uh, uh, really a, a synchronicity between the two brains. Here we found the two bands, mainly a high frequency and the low frequency bands, where the two mouse uh, are, when uh, during the interactions, between the two chambers, those two uh, frequencies shows that the, the two brains are uh, synchronous. But the, the interesting thing is that if you study the inter and intra brain synch synchronicity, you see that the two things are highly correlated. That means that uh, before the uh, interactions between the two mice, mice the brain transforms. Uh, in terms of synchronicity between the different areas. So he prepared himself to the social interactions. Then we have the social interaction and the brain are uh, at that point again different and only a few areas are synchronous between themselves. And then after the uh, social interaction, the brain transforms again in another type of, uh, uh, let's say, synchronous uh, uh, map. Okay, so that means that um, really from a psychological point of view, probably we can define that uh, the synchronicity, the relations is just the identity in somehow, because uh, the brain prepare himself to a, a, a social interaction, okay, and after the social interaction is modified. So that, that, that's very interesting. That would be absolutely uh, interesting to study what, that's exactly what we are going to do in humans, uh, the uh, by hyperscanning, but it's an high density, let's say, study with hyperscanning because in this case we want to, to study not only let's say uh, the um, let's say this sync the, the hyperscanning in a in a classical way by looking at the, the uh, synchronicity between the two brains, but we want to study how let's say the uh, correlation. Uh, the synchronicity between the, the single parts of the brain are correlated with the synchrony between the, uh, the different, uh, the, the same parts, but between the two brains. So it's inter versus intra uh, synchronicity study. Of course, uh, uh, this is very important for human in, in terms of social interactions. So uh, we are increasing with a wire free, uh, uh, let's say, miniscope on animals, the number of animals. So we are moving to three, four animals in order to study also social interaction with a higher number of animals. And we, we, we think to, to do the same on humans, to increase the number of hyperscanning experiments also on the number of humans. Let me close my, uh, my talk today with uh, uh, what uh, we are going to extend this guy, in, in which way we are going to extend the, this kind of, uh, of, uh, of uh, social interaction study in a, in, a societal, in a society environment. Of course, as everybody knows, social interaction are, are extremely important for the behavior of people and for the health and wellness of people. And they are implicated in many pathologies in which, uh, of course, the social interaction are uh, involved and in which are somehow also disturbed by, uh, by, by the, the pathology itself. And as I was saying, so our, our model is to create a strong, let's say, um, translational approach between the animal model and the human. So uh, that goes in the direction uh, that somehow I'm involved in, uh, also because I'm uh, president of the Museum of Science in, in Florence, and so I'm somehow pushing for uh, a direction in which uh, we want to involve uh, uh, in this social interaction stimuli, which are not, not only, let's say, the stimuli that you can detect from the other individual, but are coming from the environment. 
are coming from a special, let's say, kind of stimuli, which maybe could uh, be related to a, some, let's say, cultural approach. That's, that is named cultural welfare. The cultural welfare is exactly a combination, let's say, of uh, uh, cultural stimuli uh, by uh, looking at the, what are the effects in terms of wellness, of well-being, of the person in, uh, when it, when he is exposed to those kind of uh, of stimuli, and that brings us to a, a, an interesting uh, aspect, cultural, let's say, scientific aspect, which uh, which we call bioconvergence, uh, which uh, uh, is somehow bridging human sciences uh, with uh, with technologies, and uh, that comes from the fact that. Uh, uh, Bioconvergence in Israel a couple of years ago has been defined as a, a conversion between technology and biology, but uh, we, we strictly believe that, that uh, this must be even and larger to all convergence, where the technology at that point is bridging not only to biology, but also is bridging to psychology, social sciences, uh, and humanities. That's a, a, a a, a paradigm of, uh, of, of uh, let's say, of scientific study, which bring us to the past uh, where uh, it was existing only one science, okay, not different kind of sciences as we are doing nowadays, uh, which somehow describe uh, the human being. Uh, so in our case, the, the, our, our idea is to use a, a personal sensing on, on person, okay, as we are doing on an animal, uh, to study exactly by uh, highlighting in a, uh, a brain uh, uh, body approach as uh, as uh, we are we have done in hospitals for for example for air failure uh, we were doing data fusion of uh, different kind of uh, uh, let's say signals in, in in body we are replicating this study that we did some years ago. in now in this case uh, with the uh, biosignals and the uh, the idea, of course, is uh, to have a look uh, to different kind to the effect of different uh, kind of external stimuli from exteroceptions, which is the perception of uh, sight, sound, smell, touch, and taste, uh, to the interoceptions, which is the awareness of internal sensation, like the musculoskeletal uh, uh, apparatus, to the uh, proprioceptions, uh, which is. Uh, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the perception of uh, internal uh, organ, uh, uh, for example. So uh, this comes, of course, with the embodiment and that, that is uh, somehow the transfer from the stimuli to a biochemical uh, process, uh, chain process uh, into the body. Epigenetics, of course, is uh, deeply correlated to that. So uh, that brings us in terms of uh, of sensors, also the attention to to detect metabolite into into the in body and correlate metabolite with the psychological states. That means, uh, of course, that uh, um, mainly psychological aspect that has to be correlated to those, uh, uh, let's say, biomarkers are the cognitive uh, uh, workload, which is. Uh, divided in, uh, in, in different categories, like the ability to supply demand resources, mental strain during tasks, delay in information processing, and access of required capabilities to emotive state, which is again, uh, let's say, uh, divided in different category related to arousal, for example, uh, to stress, which are somehow connected to the, uh, let's say, reaction of the autonomous uh, uh, nervous system, uh, peripheric uh, uh, nervous systems uh, detection, which can be done uh, by several kinds of, uh, of, of approach, like earth rate variability, pulpical construction, electrodermal activity, and so on and so forth. So our approach is uh, it's a multimodal, uh, let's say, um, approach, which we want to uh, compare uh, different stimuli coming uh, uh, from uh, different 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 sensors but uh, we are also developing uh, uh, new photonic sensors uh, for example metabolite uh, in skins and other photonic sensor based on fluid biopsy uh, to detect a particular 
metabolite in salives, for example, and uh, to correlate all those uh, biomarkers, which could be uh, biomarkers derived from biosignals or biomarkers uh, derived from, uh, uh, let's say, uh, metabolic uh, uh, states or some, uh, uh, let's say, uh, um, detected both with wearable sensor and both offline, for example, as I was saying, on the uh, fluids. Uh, in order to have a comprehensive, uh, uh, let's say, uh, mind, uh, uh, brain, body, uh, let's say, vision. But this can be done, and this is what we are going to do, and this is uh, the very crucial point, uh, will be done by applying the same fusion, data fusion models or more individual in parallel. So what we want to do is to extend to social brains uh, this, kind of, this kind of study. Of course, this is... A lot of implications uh, to to study the reaction of of a, a group of people, the the social brain in a, in a team working. And I will, as I was telling you, as we clearly see in animal model, the social brain is combination of different brains. And I I strongly believe that uh, when we are going to study the brain, we cannot uh, uh, study the brain as an isolated organ. Of course, uh, we have to study the brain integrated in a much more complex systems like the body, but again, it's not sufficient. Uh, the, the single brain can be studied when interacting with other brains, at, at least in our species. So I believe that for a comprehensive study of the brain, we have to go in the directions of uh, considering a multiple brain interacting themselves. Of course, as I was saying, uh, uh, the algorithm that we are going to the in the problem or we are going to the rise can be applied also in learning in uh, uh, rehab therapy we are we have actually uh, some some uh, uh, experiment uh, uh, with uh, with uh, Donnocchi here in Florence uh, uh, to study some um, uh, uh, therapy rehab also in think some uh, uh, stimuli like arts music for example uh, conflict management, neuroesthetics. Uh, we we have a lab of neuroesthetics of, of the museum where we are studying uh, by using arts and music together um, the the effects of uh, of uh, of piece of arts of individual and looking uh, uh, this one in a frame in a context of social interactions. So when the diets of people in parallel they are observing the uh, the same piece of arts. Spirituality, uh, we have a, a, a let's say a project also. It's a it's a it's a, a piano, it's a recovery fund project where with monks in a Buddhist center in uh, in uh, in Pisa we are we are studying uh, together with a group of Pisa the uh, synchronicity between brains of two people meditating uh, in the same moment. Of course, training, problem solving. And that's the, the point I was to, to highlight as the final slide of my talk. I mean, <coughs> as I was saying, <clears throat> the brain has a sense when considered in a social environment. And what comes out, comes out that from social brain, we have also social consciousness. And the social consciousness that has been studied also in several, in several papers, that could impact a lot on the evolution of, of a society. So I, I deeply believe that those kind of study, as just the last slide, with the, this kind of studies, so we can uh, really, uh, let's, say, let's say, working in a really interdisciplinary way, find uh, protocols, new kind of protocols to improve uh, the wellness of people, but also in, in, in the social aspects, I have to say, and I'm going to refer to conflict management, for example. We were with, the, with, the, with Franco in Israel uh, with the, in a conference exactly on cultural welfare with special conflict management. Uh, and there, as you can imagine, in Israel, this is very crucial aspects. I think that, that we, here we have a big opportunity as scientists to bring science, to bring, uh, let's say, objective uh, and measurable, uh, let's say, parameters in a context uh, which is a psychological and social context uh, to solve real problems. 
So, uh, okay, this is the experiment uh, we are doing uh, at, uh, at the museum about uh, neuroesthetics, as I was uh, telling you before. And uh, the, the, the take home message from all these kind of things is that we have to think to a society in which we cannot uh, think about, uh, uh, let's say, the different, let's say, aspects of the life of individuals being independent of each other. Let's say a oh, uh, uh, program of well being in hospitals, in music center, in spirituality center, in sports center, schools, for example, centers, and so on, must be thought in an integrated way. Because a children that has a tumor, for example, spend his morning in, uh, in, uh, in the school, then goes to the hospital, and maybe goes in a uh, sports center in the evening, and maybe in the, in the night he goes to listen to some music with his mother. And this kind of uh, uh, moments of the life of, of the person must be somehow integrated in a, in a, in a well-being uh, program, uh, which it's an overall program. And uh, we cannot establish uh, simply by protocol, by political and social protocol. We must bring science inside in order to, to show which is the best way to, be to organize the social relationships, organize stimuli, Organize a classroom lecture, for example, in order to improve the wellness of people. Of course, the impact here is also on health because that prevents a lot, uh, some kind of pathologies that could come uh, from stress and, uh, and from critical life condition. So I'd like to thank uh, the people of, uh, of, of my, my group of Lens, uh, but also all the, all the people with which we are interacting uh, uh, to those uh, to do that kind of study, and also I hope to be in time. You for your attention. Thank you, Francesco. So you have put so much thing, <laughs> so many things uh, here that it is really difficult uh, to so to ask questions. But please, if some of you have some uh, comments or question, um, no. But okay. And please come here because you Thank you. Um, when you're gathering data from humans, do I do I have to imagine them also wearing uh, um, machines on their heads, just like the mice? Yes. Okay. Well, and if so, um, do you think? that by itself might affect their uh, relationships? No, no, funciona. Okay, yeah, that's a very good question. In fact, one of the first work uh, we, we are doing uh, with, uh, with Francesco that is here, it's uh, exactly to use uh, machine learning to, to see if we move from an high density element and, and wearable sensors, okay? which at the very beginning are scientific ones. So are, let's say, not very easy to bring. For example, in, in a museum, you have to uh, have a look and look at the visit of museum or interact at school or learn at school. You have to wear simple sensors, which do not affect with social interaction, exactly as you say. So the first step to be done is that, can we use machine learning in this case to transfer from a, a I, let's say, scientific high cost, uh, not very wearable, up, uh, let's say, um, apparatus to a very easy and wearable apparatus, maybe low cost apparatus, to have the same sensitivity on the same biomarkers. That's the first point. So the first point is to reduce the, uh, let's say, the, co the complicated apparatus to the simplest one in order to be really applied on the field by keeping the sensitivity on the biomarkers you are interested in to detect. So it's, that's a very critical point. That's a very good point. Thank you. And uh, I have another question. Uh, you have presented uh, about the zebrafish mainly, the way of manipulating uh, also the brain. No, you can measure and manipulate, but you can you really drive the fish as you want? Or in another sense, is it possible to synchronize in some sense uh, the the fish with uh, with?
with another fish, for instance, a measure from one fish and uh, impose the state on the other fish, which would be extremely interesting. <laughs> you mean uh, uh, synchronize the movement, the trajectory, no, or the, what? The main idea is to synchronize the brain of part of the brain. So clearly, if it is possible, clearly it would open a wide <laughs> opportunity for manipulating it, clearly. I think uh, it is most, more possible on so elementary brains like zebrafish or I don't know, insects or something like this. But I would like to know if it is really possible to impose at least partially a state, a, a desired state on the brain of animals. In terms, in order to influence a behavior, you mean? For in order to yes, this is possible. This has been done, uh, for example, on mouse with optogenetics, uh, for example, to uh, to um, control the sexual stimuli of mouse or to control the aggress aggressive uh, uh, the aggressive stimuli on mouse and behavior. Um, so yes, it is possible. Uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, we are at the beginning, so this is on simple things. Uh, but uh, everything uh, depends on how we really understand uh, in, in which way we can dissect the neural correlates in components. And that's a, a, an important thing we are doing. At the very beginning, we were thinking to, to have, uh, uh, let's say, uh, an invariant, let's say, neural correlate, mm -hmm. which is, uh, let's say, uh, uh, constant from individual to individual, above uh, the biological variability. Mm -hmm. Then we saw that this is quite a naive concept, but we found that the neural correlates can be decomposed in a linear combination of components. And those components are the same from individual to individual. Mm -hmm. So we create, uh, let's say, what we call a super mouse, okay, which is a digital mouse, and with that kind of classificator, Alessandro Scaglione, who is not here nowadays, today, he is able to predict also some behavior. For example, we are now able to predict the reaction to rehabilitation after stroke with optogenetics mm -hmm. to see if this will be successful 30%, 40%, or 50%. So I think that in principle, so yes. At least you can have a digital twin of your... Exactly. Subject. We have a digital twin for a moment, yes. Okay. Thank you. And uh, so we are a bit late, but not a problem. We still have time to, to recover. So I invite the uh, next speaker. So I thank again for Okay, so next, uh, okay, our next speaker is Maria Michela Del Viva, role of the cost of plasticity in determining the features of fast vision in humans. Please, have 25 minutes. Yes, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you very much for having invited me to this uh, uh, event. Uh, this, done, this work is done in collaboration between uh, uh, Department of Neurofarm at University of Florence and uh, the Departments of Physics and Mathematics at the University of Pisa. And I'm going to talk about uh, how the cost of uh, plasticity, the possibility to be plastic, plastic for a system, how much it costs and how this possibility shapes uh, the features in uh, human vision. Uh, now, we know that uh, the visual system receives a lot of data in input and it's not possible to process uh, all of this data because we have too few neurons to do that. So, uh, very early in the visual stream, the visual system has to operate a strong compression of data and many models have been proposed to uh, simulate this uh, and they have proposed strategies like uh, reduction of uh, redundancy 
um, Mar has proposed uh, a little more recently than uh, original studies that uh, this problem is solved by creating a, a sketch. Comp what is the? No. Dov'è il puntatore? Ok. Ok, um, by creating a summary, a compact representation of the image based on few simple primitives like lines or edges. And it's true that we can actually reconstruct images by using only simple lines or edges. Now, the problem of... Uh, The problem of uh, uh, data reduction is even more important when uh, fast processing is needed uh, in order to survive. Um, more recently, to this data reduction problem, they have added uh, also uh, um, uh, the need to uh, have algorithms that uh, save costs that are computationally uh, not so heavy because uh, to mm, the, visual, the, the, the brain in general has uh, physical limitation so it has computational limitation during to the number of neurons to the need of saving energy so this led to the idea of uh, uh, efficient coding now most modeling in this area they don't uh, take into account uh, the sorry 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 uh, uh, how much time it takes to implement uh, the equation the equations that they use so the computing power that is needed and also uh, the problem of implementation is not uh, is not uh, correctly addressed because they mostly they don't uh, uh, take into account how much, uh, how these, these uh, equations are calculated. Uh, and then there is another issue. We know that uh, uh, there are several evidence that our brain uh, and also the visual system is very plastic. And we know that, uh, that in, uh, during development, for example, uh, humans or animals, uh, they need to see the world in order to improve their uh, visual function. And uh, as long as they see the world, uh, their, their cortical cell, they tune their properties to match the statistic, the properties of the statistic of natural image. And uh, this happens also during adulthood. So plasticity is, is, is continuous until we die. We, our brain is, oh, is plastic and is able to learn new things. So, uh, for example, an example of this is the, uh, is the other race effect, which is the phenomenon for which uh, we learn how to discriminate uh, fine visual uh, uh, facial features of people of different ethnicity, and this happens with training. And also training uh, is important uh, to learn, to discriminate uh, fine uh, uh, and unusual uh, patterns, for example, in medical image, okay? So uh, plasticity is uh, um, uh, an important uh, feature of uh, our brain. So we think that a model that aim to do this uh, uh, compression and wants to be realistic has to uh, allow for updating in response to the external environment. And we think also that this feature is not uh, something that can be added to an existing model, but has to be an integral part of the model since its inception. So, uh, we, uh, we devised uh, a model that has uh, these characteristics of up updatability and also implementability. Uh, this model models uh, 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 an early stage of vision. 
So we assume that uh, there is uh, an early filter, sorry, an early filter, which receives in the input a large flux of information and produce in the output a summary of this information. Um, the summary is based on recognizing and filtering a limited number of features or patterns, whatever, in, of the input, dropping all the rest. So it operates a lossy compression. It's, uh, um, this approach actually is, has been used and implemented in uh, fast electronic devices using AI energy physics, where they have a large amount of data and they have to process uh, this data very, very, very fast. So it's implementable. So this, uh, um, we assume that this filter contains uh, a limited number of units that match the, uh, the features in the, in the external world and also that produces in output uh, um, a limited, so the output uh, the bandwidth is very limited. So it's a kind of uh, funnel. So now the important, uh, uh, the, the summary of information produced uh, depends on uh, what are these guys that are stored in here. So the assumption is that the set of filters stored in here is optimized uh, to yield in output maximum entropy. within the constraint of uh, limited number and limited <coughs> output uh, bandwidth represents uh, the optimal solution that depends on the statistics of uh, the input. Now, uh, we have implemented this model as an uh, heuristic. So, what kind of filters uh, do we choose? Uh, we the, um, for the optimality. Uh, the, the, we, we, we chose the, 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 fil the filters, the patterns, that individually provide maximum entropy per computational cost with these two types of cost, bandwidth and storage cost associated to each feature. Okay? So each pattern has a value is the entropy provided, but also two costs. And uh, a reasonable approach is to take the maximum of the two. So the heuristic recipe for the, for determining the set of uh, uh, pattern is to calculate the probability for each possible pattern and then calculate the function for each pattern, the entropy yield for unit. So this is the, the, the shape of this function. So we select all the patterns that have a value of this function higher than a threshold. And this threshold is set to comply with the two, uh, with the two costs. Okay? Uh, the complexity of this algorithm is, uh, uh, is uh, proportional to the number of, uh, of patterns stored in the module and uh, goes logarithmically with the, the total number of possible patterns that are present in the input. 
Okay? So this is not uh, mathematically rigorous, but it's very close to it. So in practice, what we do is that we saw all the patterns in order uh, according to F, and we select those that comply with the maximum of the two, uh, the maximal of the two uh, costs. Now, this is uh, a heuristic, this uh, heuristic faster selection can be adapted dynamically to the changes in the quality standard of the environment, but also changes in the system. Why? Because uh, we know that uh, our system changes. We grow, uh, we get uh, older, and so the number of new growths, but also the value of the system changes. So in this case, uh, uh, for example, is the bandwidth uh, decrease, uh, the, the, um, the selection changes and the boundary between selected and discarded features are, is uh, changes. Yeah. Another condition is that uh, when the statistic of indicator changes. In this case, whatever, for example, we can have uh, a, a feature here that become uh, which is rare to see, but become very, very frequent in the input. So in this case, it jumps there, and since the number of total features is limited, something from here has to jump down. Okay. So to change the, to adapt to the external or internal system, it, what is, is done is just to move the, this boundary up and down. So uh, when something changes, the bulk of uh, features of network to code this feature stays constant. And some, just a few of them change. So it's adaptable to the external, <coughs> adaptable to the external world. Now, uh, this is an heuristic. Uh, is there a theoretical framework in which we can frame this? Yes, there is, uh, because our problem is a specific case of a more general and uh, known class of mathematical problem called the Knapsack problem, which is something like that. Imagine you are a thief, you have, you have a sack, and you want to rob, and you want to maximize your game, and you want to rob many things. Okay? The things that you have to put in the sack have a weight and a size. These are the constraints, the analogous of our constraints, bandwidth and number, and the value is the attribute. Okay? So there is a solution, an exact mathematical solution to this problem uh, that can be reached by solving this discrete optimization. But uh, the problem is this that uh, the, the solution is very, very complex because it, it goes exponentially with the total number of features to be, to be solved. So it takes a lot of time for computers to solve this. It's very practical for the, for the system. It's one of the so-called NPI problems, uh, difficult to solve algorithmically. That's why, that's why they are solved generally numerically. So, um, what we did is that we said, okay, uh, is, let's compare our heuristic with the exact solution and see what happens in the same, on the same ground. Uh, so, the, the, the exact solution is so difficult that even with, the, with our simulation, we could not implement it. So, we use uh, uh, an approximation that is almost Exact, that reduce the problem from exponential to polynomial, the complexity from exponential to polynomial. So it's much more doable and uh, implementable and uh, runnable on our uh, computers. And then we computed the both solutions, the exact, this one uh, from Cabral, and uh, our heuristic. So we calculated for both entropy as a function of the two parameters. So in most of the space of the parameters, 
for uh, W larger than this uh, curve, the two solutions are equivalent. They are different along this, along this curve and uh, in, the, in the surrounding. So if this is, can be seen better if you do the different normalized difference between these two uh, uh, entropies. And we can see that they are identical here. They differ in this region, but the difference is always be, uh, below 10%. So they are quite similar, uh, which is uh, interesting per se. Now we, um, we go to uh, measure the difference, sorry. We go to measure the difference between the two solutions in a range where, of parameters, where that is, uh, um, in, is derived by the property of the visual field in uh, the visual uh, uh, system. Uh, we did the previous experiment in 2013, and we found that for this range of parameters, the uh, heuristic solution uh, is uh, describes the behavior of the visual system very, very, very well. So, in this, for this uh, couple of uh, parameters, there is uh, a small difference between the exact and, uh, and, uh, and the heuristic, about the percent. But, also, but even if it's small, it's, they are different. So, we can compare them for this set of parameters. First, we do a comparison, a theoretical so the exact solution is more efficient, but it's much more complex and even more important is much less stable and applicable. Why? Because uh, uh, the exact solution uh, is very unstable uh, for uh, changes of the probability of a on the denominator here. So very small perturbation in the input produce a very different solution. So if something changes, it's not biologically plausible because if something changes in the, uh, in the probability of the, uh, the, the statistics of natural if we adopt, if the system adopts the solution, it has to rerun completely the, the, the the problem and possibly comes out with a completely different solution from the previous one. So, small difference in, prob in uh, probability of occurrence of uh, features in the world can produce very different solution, and uh, and this uh, uh, would require would require a reorganization of uh, the entire map. While the heuristic is much more stable, it does we don't need to do it and also, it's easier to implement it in, uh, with a parallel system. Now, the exact solution is efficient, it's more efficient, but uh, it's much slower and complex and harder to update than the original. So, what does the visual system choose for its uh, function? More efficiency or more adaptability? So, we implemented this uh, in vision. So we take, uh, how do we calculate uh, the, these features? We take an image database, we digitize the image to one bit because the complexity is exponential with the number of bits. We, uh, we uh, consider uh, features fit three by three pixels because also the complexity goes with the size, so we want to keep this low. We calculate the probability distribution of all these possible 512 uh, uh, features in the image database. We apply our algorithm, we calculate F, and we select F with, uh, uh, that are uh, under the maximum of this uh, function. And these are the features selected. As you can see right now, is that uh, these features the, the shape of these features resemble the filters found in the primary visual cortex. So the filters that we have in the primary visual cortex 
cortex have a shape that complies with maximum, uh, maximum entropy uh, transfer, but they are uh, subjected to limit, uh, physical limitation. And this is very interesting per se. But let's go on. Our model um, uh, predicts that we keep the original image only this feature and we discard completely the rest. So as you can see, some features are preserved uh, despite a stronger reduction of information, percent, and uh, we did the experiment and we saw that the stimulation of performance based on the sketch is equivalent to, uh, is, is, uh, is very, very good. So now we compare the, the exact one to so extract the exact features and the heuristic feature that you've seen before. And we do the sketches, we extracted the sketches. And you can see they are very, very similar. But uh, there are a lot of features in common in the two sets. And if I use just the features that are common in the two sets, I, I obtain very recognizable sketches. So what we did is that we used only the features that are heuristic only or exact only. So we exclude all the features that are in common between the two sets and just from here you can see that uh, the solutions are completely different. This is much better than this. We measure this with psychophysics is what we do. So we present for very uh, short times uh, uh, the sketch, either in heuristic or exact, there are a lot, I'll show you the same one, but we use uh, lots of images, we randomize everything, and we present for just 20 milliseconds, just a flash, one of the two, of one sketch. We use this short presentation because we want to prove early stages of visual analysis. Then we mask, and then we ask, which one did you see before? Yes, I'm almost there. And uh, this is an example of uh, what you see with the timing is completely different, of course. Left or right? This is different. So you are forced to, to do, uh, to give, to, work, to provide an answer. And these are the results. These are uh, different subjects, probability of correct responses over many, many trials. Uh, for the heuristics uh, sketch and for the exam sketch. You can see that with the heuristic you are almost at 100% correct, while with, uh, with uh, the, the exact some subject you are, uh, this is chance level of five. So, the heuristic predicts the behavior of the human brain much better. So, computability and plasticity are uh, the, the, of the solution uh, take your precedence over the efficiency. So, by taking into account the cost of computation needed by an adaptable system, we were able to predict correctly real human visual performance. Thank you very much. Some problems here in the computer, but uh, at least for you, we have followed the, uh, the talk. Uh, I have a lot of questions, but first, uh, I would like to ask you if you want to comment. Uh, please. No. Uh, okay, I, I can go. <laughs> That's the question we have time to discuss here. Uh, first of all, uh, you showed that uh, uh, at the beginning uh, that uh, you have these filters. Yes. But so, uh, we were thinking, uh, also we learned there many times, about how these filters are selected according to your predisposition. Because you know that if you can have some kind of probably blindness in which you are looking, for instance, for some object, but you are visualizing a different, uh, uh, say, shape, uh, what you were looking for, and you can pass in front of things without even not seeing them. Oh, they are not on the so it's essentially the filters that the these are very low level. Yeah. So oh. we are uh, in the uh, primary visual cortex basically. 
even know. We don't know. We are doing experiments to try to understand where, because this, this is uh, the, the, the building blocks of our science now that uh, we use to move our eyes very quickly towards okay. location. But we are is that a good thing that we need to go to the maximization of our end, do we? Yes. Where all the, say, the end become complete the problem in denial. With the, the, we can decide that with the maximization of entropy is subjected to some constraints. Mm -hmm. Not to the uh, no. Here. Yeah. Uh, there, uh, there were two um, yeah. less than uh, x px less than uh, w. Ah, in the, in the, yeah, well, I have the. This one. Okay. So actually, if you put the here equalities, this is exactly the problem of physical mechanics. Not to start to maximize the entropy subjected to some constraints. So, yes, it's always the same problem. Okay, but you know the solution because the, no, the solution is the mathematical exact solution. No, with the quality, yes, because it is a equivalent branch multiplier. Yes, yes, yes. The yes. same distribution. So maybe. I don't can, know if it's uh, the same problem. Okay, maybe not. Maybe not. It's the same as the law, no? That's into the problem of this Yeah. Okay, okay so uh, thanks. I think we can. Uh, I, I, I'm sure that also people there with the, the working on artificial intelligence would uh, say have a, a lot of ideas about uh, uh, this kind of problem. So I think we, we have time to discuss. Thanks. Uh, let me try to fix the problem here. There has been a, a leak of a connection for some moment, so something is Morning. Um, I am Elena Feritella, a first year PhD in, in uh, psychology, first year, first year PhD student in psychology uh, at the University of Florence, and uh, I am currently working on a uh, dev development uh, of a community based uh, virtual environment inter intervention for the prevention of bullying. But today I'm not here to tell you about my project, but about an article that uh, has already been published in the European Journal uh, of Investigation in Health, Psychology and Education, written together with Professor Andrea Guazzini, Dr. Mirko Duradoni and other colleagues who are part of the Virtulab a university laboratory in psychology of virtual environment. 
My presentation today, uh, as the title suggests, is about how people with uh, OCD syndromes, so people with obsessive compulsive disorder syndromes, experience social media. <laughs> Sorry, one moment. Okay. Starting from the beginning, uh, the definition of obsessive compulsive spectrum disorders are characterized by invasive mental content and people must practice continuous mental or behavioral activities, also called uh, rituals, to relieve the, their discomfort. All these activities are always ego dystonic. That is, uh, uh, they, they are inconsistent with person values. This type of disorder is uh, uh, well explained by a cycle uh, that has as the basic concept, the uh, concept of obsession and compulsion. So the cycle starts with obsessive thought uh, that causes uh, um, anxiety and stress in people. Vabbè, fa un po' di confusione, ma... <laughs> no, no, non fa niente, fa niente. Uh, so, the cycle starts with uh, uh, obsessive thought uh, that creates anxiety in, uh, in subject to experience that, uh, and that people try to eliminate uh, using act, act or behavior uh, called compulsions. The latter creates a, a temporary sense of relief uh, until the obsession reappears and the cycle begins all over again. So obsessions are defined as a repetitive and persistent thought or images that enter the mind in a recursive and intrusive way, causing stress or anxiety. The main, um, the main aim uh, of this, uh, the, the obsessive is that patients try to attempt or ignore the uh, obsession or try to neutralize them with another talk to or another action, the compulsions, that are defined as repetitive behavior or mental act that individuals feel compelled to perform in response to an obsession. But they are not realistically uh, related to what they are supposed to prevent or they are cl clearly uh, excessive. In the literature, we can find uh, different types of OCD. In this slide, uh, I summarized the most common uh, that, what, that, uh, that were contamination and cleaning type, the check checking type, just right, indecisiveness and uh, uh, hoarding. I tried to define them uh, one by one, but very, very briefly. In the contamination and cleaning types, uh, the obsession and the compulsion are related to both realistic and unrealistic uh, contagion or contamination ideas. While in the checking types, uh, people uh, were engaged in multiple safety checking compulsions, such as checking that family members are safe or that uh, uh, doors and windows are clo uh, were closed. Here, the main aim is to uh, prevent obsessive uh, uh, thinking related to the major harm to oneself or to one other. The just right type is characterized by unpleasant feelings of the things are not uh, uh, just right or are not fair. Many researchers think that just right uh, um, are only a trait of uh, OCD patients, but uh, the most widely used OCD uh, inventory that, uh, that was the um, Vancouver Obsessional Compulsive Inventory uh, used a, a scale for the just right type. 
indecisiveness um, may be related to the amount of time that people uh, uh, need to perform the compulsions. Uh, in fact, uh, mm, often people experience obsession, postpone or avoid decision in order to minimize the risk of making mistakes of being less than perfect. Last but not least, the ordering types uh, is uh, um, characterized by a persistent tendency to accumulate objects, um, regardless of their values, until they clutter passions home. Uh, because the um, need to uh, have these objects and don't, don't to eliminate them uh, creates stress and anxiety. In the last few decades, social media have become the most common socialization uh, arena, and uh, they affect uh, both uh, social interaction of users and pr psychological process, uh, creating uh, in uh, passions uh, something like uh, uh, social media addiction or negative coping strategies. So the question is, uh, um, may the, the specific social dynamics of uh, social media uh, can affect differently people with OCD symptoms and people without OCD symptoms. Maybe yes, because the, uh, the social media in the social media platform, the number of shared posts, the number of followers reached, and the number of likes received are highly valued. So let's think about a uh, um, people person with a high hoarding symptom. So, a person who uh, collects things without need them. How he can uh, live, how he, he can experience such dynamics? Maybe not good, uh, maybe uh, he, he can collect and uh, done a lot of behavior, uh, a, a lot of online collective behavior, even in the online world and non, not only in the real world. So, in the literature, there are not many studies that investigate uh, the impact of social media on OCD people, and even fewer studies consider the subtype of OCD. So, our study uh, fits into this context, trying to understand how people with OCD symptoms experience social media, both in terms of importance of the use and uh, on the impact of uh, social media on their mood. Uh, paying attention also to the subtype of OCD experience. So firstly, we uh, developed two hypotheses. The first hypothesis uh, is uh, um, linked to the effect of social media on uh, individual smooth that we expected to be higher in people with OCD compared to the uh, non-clinical population. The second hypothesis, um, we expected that people with high OCD score uh, had a greater importance of social media than individuals with lower OCD score. We also analyzed the uh, differences in terms uh, both of importance and impact on mood uh, of people with OCD compared to the non-OCD people. So, um, we firstly developed an anonymous online survey, mainly shared uh, with, uh, uh, on Facebook and Instagram, that was composed by 11 sections for a total of 86 items uh, using a Likert scale for the responses. And the completion time was about 15 minutes. The uh, data collection and the development of uh, such survey um, do uh, start from Jan, uh, June 2020 uh, until December 10, 2020 for a total of six months. Uh, so the data collection took place during the first year of our COVID-19 pandemic, a period of time in which uh, the use of social media was uh, at its uh, peak all over the world. Our sample was composed by 660 participants with a mean age of 25 years old uh, and uh, showed uh, gender imbalance uh, because 71% of uh, uh, the sample was female and only the 29% was male. 
The survey firstly uh, asked about social demographic information like uh, sex, age, and education. Uh, for the score of the obsessive compulsive uh, uh, symptoms, we used the Italian validation of the Vancouver Obsessional Compulsive Inventory. Uh, that was a, a scale that uh, with five, uh, 55 uh, items using a five-point Likert scale allowed us to assess both the um, behavioral and the cognitive aspect of OCD, reporting the five subtypes of OCD mentioned above. Thus, we create and used two ad hoc items that assessing the perceived impact of social media on mood, asking participants, using social media usually affect your mood, and other one for uh, assess the perceived importance they placed on social media use, asking them how important do you think social media is to you? Both of our uh, ad hoc items use a five-point Likert scale for the responses. As for the data analysis, before the recruitment of participants, several power analysis was performed using the G-Power software uh, in order to identify the adequate sample sites for the sample. As we recruited 760 participants, we uh, considered good our sample sites. As for the descriptive statistics, mean and standard deviation were used for the uh, continuous uh, variable and percentages was also collected. As for the inferential analysis, uh, we tested if uh, age, sex, and all the OCD scores of the Vancouver uh, uh, Obsessional Compassive Inventory was associated with the importance and the impact of mood of social media on people using Welsh t-tests. So here the, the result of the descriptive statistics. As we can see from this slide, for all the type of OCD, uh, the scores of people um, between uh, above the 19th percentile, that is in another slide, sorry, uh, the scores of people uh, above the 19th percentile, so people who score a very high level of OCD symptoms, are always uh, um, higher than people without OCD symptoms. In our sample, uh, the 22% of, uh, um, of the participants uh, scored the be, uh, before, the, above the 19th percentile, so are classified as people with high OCD symptoms. Moreover, indecisiveness, just right, and obsession are the most common uh, type or subtype of OCD in our sample. As for the age, uh, we didn't find differences in males and females for what, uh, for what concern both the importance they attach to social media and the impact of social media on their mood. Instead, the age showed a small uh, negative but significant correlation with, but, uh, with all our, our variables. As for the age, um, explain only the 3% of the variables, we uh, decided to not consider uh, sex and age as possible co-funding variables for the um, testing of uh, our two hypotheses. So in this slide, we can see the result of the inferential analysis for what concern uh, social media impact on mood for each OTCD type. For all the type, the uh, people with high OCD uh, so people uh, above the cutoff for OCD uh, disorder are always higher than people without uh, OCD symptoms. In particular, ordering and indecisiveness seems to be the most uh, impacted on uh, mood. The same uh, results uh, seems to be uh, true even for the social media perceived importance uh, of uh, OCD people. So people with high OCD symptoms are always uh, greater in factor and make um, are more importance attached to social media with the ordering type that seems to be the uh, most affected. The differences uh, 
between the importance and the impact on mood uh, on people uh, with OCD symptoms and people without OCD symptoms are not uh, linear. In fact, uh, OCD people and non-OCD people seem more similar when uh, we are talking about the importance they uh, attach to social media. While uh, the differences uh, of the impact of social media on their mood are greater for OCD uh, people than non-OCD people. Finally, we also test if our, if our two ad hoc items changed and how it, uh, they changed um, across the, the OCD types. In this slide, we can see that, uh, as already highlighted by the result of the t-test, the uh, light-colored line that refers to people uh, that score below the uh, cutoff for OCD are always, are always lower than the red and blue vivid lines that refer to people with high score of OCD symptoms. In this slide, it seems that hoarding are the most affected in terms of importance of OCD, for OCD, while indecisiveness seems to be the most affected in, term, in terms of uh, mood. No one of these differences uh, turned to be significant in the Welsh t-test, maybe due uh, of a lack of power. So finally, all uh, our two hypotheses uh, were, was confirmed. So almost all the type of OCD are affected by social media in terms of mood, even if our results don't allow us to um, understand the, the uh, direction and the frequency of changes. Moreover, all type of OCD appear to give the social media more importance than non-OCD people. Finally, um, we have to note that people with OCD symptoms use social media like uh, everyone else. So maybe uh, attention should, should be paid to the development of inclusive and supportive virtual environment for all. So, for people with OCD and people without OCD. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's all. I don't know if Andrea wants to add some information, but uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Elena. Uh, are there questions or comments? Please, uh, can... Here you are. Uh, thank you very much. It was very interesting. Uh, I have uh, basically two small questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, how, I, how many? I mean, how many people with OCD were in your um, ensemble in in all the? And the second one is, uh, if you could uh, elaborate a little bit on the the meaning of the column you were uh, uh, circling. You know, at the end. Okay, I, I turn to the slide. Coens, I think, was the name of the column or something like that. Yeah, exactly. So in our sample, uh, we found uh, that 22% of, uh, of, of, of participants with a high level of OCD. Uh, so uh, I don't know if it's, uh, I, don't, I don't think it's, uh, there are uh, perfect numbers, it's just a percentage, so okay. maybe we can... Uh, calculated 22% of uh, 660 participants. Uh, and uh, the second question, I think, is uh, related to this slide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, OK. Exactly. Uh, what are the questions? Uh, what does the Cohen's D mean? Uh, the Cohen's D is the side effect of the, uh, the, the correlation. So, uh, it uh, uh, explained that hoarding and indecisiveness uh, are the most uh, impacted uh, from the, are the most relevant uh, variable for what concerns the impact of mood uh, on, okay. uh, on social okay. media. Uh, it does, it uh, um, describes uh, the importance of this variable on the uh, impact on the, okay. so the if variable. It, if it's one, it's like it's super important. Yes. Okay, okay. Yes. Okay, like only Thanks. that can explain everything. Okay, thank you.
Okay, thanks to all. If there are no other questions, um, we have the coffee break here. And um, uh, another question? And uh, so we start again at uh, half past 11. Thank you. 